has given me for today is a word that if you've ever been to church for any certain amount of time, you've probably heard this preached before. And the title of the sermon for today is One Day at a Time. One Day at a Time. And the funny thing about this message is that in theory, it seems extremely, extremely easy to do. Right? The principle is simple. Don't worry about everything else that's going on a week, a month, a year from now. Just focus in on today. Just focus in on one day at a time. But there's a scripture in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in the 31st verse, that reads the following. And it says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In other words, why go borrowing trouble from tomorrow when today is filled with enough trouble of its own? I don't know about you, but I, I often find myself falling into this trap of not worrying about just today, but trying to prepare and trying to figure out how I'm going to take care of tomorrow. And as Christians, we like to think that we're above this, but we know that we live in a real world and we face lots of situations, circumstances that do kind of make us worry. I tell you, everything seemed to be okay when I was younger. And then I got married and then I had a whole set of things that I began to worry about. We'll be able to afford this. Will we be able to get a house? Will we be able to get a car? Will we be able to do that? This, the other thing. And then just when I felt like I had it all figured out and I was able to worry about just today, then we had kids. And that changed everything. Because I don't know about you, when you get kids, you start thinking about every possible thing that could ever go wrong. And not only that, you got all kinds of bills that you got to worry about, Oh, they need braces, and oh, they need, uh, they need driver's ed, and oh, they got to go to the prom. And you're like, wow, your life becomes nothing more than a human calculator. You're like, that's going to cost this, and that's going to cost that. And the next thing you know, you're just constantly worried about how can I, how will I, instead of just taking the time to just enjoy the moment in the day that you're living in. And so many of us fall, our, fall into this situation, but God wants us to understand that we cannot be distracted from the present. Today is a precious day. This moment in time is valuable. Once you get past today, once you get past this time, you can't get it back. You can never get this moment back again. You can have others like this, but you can never have this moment in time again. So God wants us to learn to focus in on today and not become so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And it also teaches us to rely on God. That's the key to being successful in our spiritual walk is to really learn to have faith every single day for what God is going to do in your life. But oftentimes when we lose sight of God and we lose sight of the fact that he is steering and guiding our life, we fall into that trap once again. And, and, and it always seems to like leave our mind all the successes that God has done for us. Like every single time we find ourselves in jeopardy and God delivers us, we do like the Israelites. For a brief moment, they're, they're all excited and they're all in on Christ and, oh, he delivered us from this and he delivered us from that. But every time they would always go back and start doubting him all over again. And I can't even, I can't even fault them because I know that I do the same. I feel as though I believe. I feel as though I trust him. But then something comes to shake me just a little bit, shake my confidence shake my, my belief, my understanding of who God is for me. But we got to just continue to remind ourselves, don't worry about tomorrow. 
focus on today. And so God is reminding us that this is a very, very important thing for us to do. And the reason why God wanted me to teach this now and at this particular junction is because how many of you are here for the deliverance service? Raise your hands. And how many of you believe that you really b- b- uh, receive deliverance? Now, how many of you have been challenged by the enemy since you received your deliverance? Yeah, all the same hands are still going up. And why is that? Did you not get your deliverance? Yeah, you believe you got your deliverance. But the thing is that deliverance is not a one-time thing. Deliverance is a process that you must go through. That day when you came up for deliverance and you asked God to deliver you from whatever your situation was, a seed was planted in your life in the form of that deliverance. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process that we have to evolve through. We are forever changing from that point. God has begun something in you and he is going to continue to work on it. I have here something that we all probably have seen before. You remember this, right? Good old Rubik's Cube. This thing has tormented many days in my life. When I was a child, I used to try to solve this thing all the time. And I never got past four sides. I was so, so close, but I could never get past four sides. And Leroy would get frustrated. (laughs) Leroy understood that you could break this thing apart and take every single one of these squares out and put it back together in the way that it was supposed to be. And Leroy did that and said, look what I did. I solved the cube. And then later on, Leroy got smarter and said, I'm not doing all that. So Leroy took all the stickers off and put them back the way they were supposed to be. Now, Leroy didn't want to have to go through the process of figuring out how to solve the problem. He just took the shortcut. But what I'm here to ask you today is if you look at this cube right here and you look at this, what would you say this color, what this is supposed to be right here? Do you know what's? It's got multicolors. Some are saying red. Some are saying blue. Orange. We don't know right now, right? But this is like us. God has started something in our life. And on the surface right now, you can't really tell what it is. But as God begins to shift and move the pieces around in our life, it starts to take on new form. And then again, he starts to change us yet again And you see that, wow, okay, I'm starting to see a pattern evolve in this. Many times people look at our lives and they see us as what we once were, and we're saying, wow, I remember this person when. And they like to remind us of all the negative things that we were. But over time, when God starts to evolve us, and he starts to shift us and turn us and shape us and mold us, you start to see some differences in our lives. And yes, God did begin to deliver us, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have problems because every time he moves us in one direction, usually there's a side effect in another direction. So as he continues to move us in one side, Yeah, this side looks pretty good. But now another side looks like it's a mess. And I don't know about you, but in my life, I feel like this happens all the time. Just when we think we got one part of our life all figured out, all of a sudden, something else happens, and now it looks like another area in my life is full of chaos. Now, yeah, this is looking good, but yeah... Yeah, your marriage is looking good, but the next thing you know, your car breaks down. And you're like, Lord, how could you let this happen? I just got one problem fixed, and another problem comes up. 
And God seems to always be challenging us with these issues. And we keep saying, God, I'm going to trust in you. God, I'm going to put it in your hands. God, I know that you could do this. I know that you promised this to me. But somehow things keep shifting and changing in our life. And we can't seem to solve it. And God is saying, you're not truly putting yourselves in my hands. You're still trying to solve it on your own. Still trying to do this on your own. But God said that I have a plan for you. Focus on today. Focus on now. And of course, now that I'm here in front of everybody, I can't figure out this cube. (laughs) But if we keep twisting this long enough, we can come to a solution that will work. And then you start to see the pattern form, and I'm going to just have to go and take the stickers off. (laughs) Because I can't figure out this pattern. But if I solve this this, this cube, right, and I get all the colors fixed, and I look at it, and I were to tell you, okay, look at this, and you say, yeah, that's clearly orange. It was meant to be orange. This is our life. You may have disfigured, but God is still working on all the other areas of your life. And as he's moving the pieces in our lives around, fixing you and molding you and shaping you and getting you to where you, he wants you to be, and he finally gets an area of your life right, he needs you to say, God, thank you for fixing me. Thank you for delivering me from that. Thank you for shaping me and molding me into what you want me to be. But too many times what we do is instead of focusing on what God has done for you today, you take your eyes off today and you say, but God, what about the rest of it? And you know what you say to God? God, I know you fixed me today and I know this part looks good, but here, God, I need you to fix the rest of that, and I need you to fix it today. So by the end of the service, I need you to solve the rest of that cube. (laughs) You see his face? He didn't even want to take it. He gave it to somebody else. (laughs) But so many times we do that to God. We're like, my life is a complete mess, but I need you to solve it, and I need you to solve it right now. Here, God, take it and solve my problems. Make me perfect. And God said, no, that's not how this works. There's a process involved. There's a lot of moving parts to our lives. But we need to learn that God wants us to take it one day at a time. He is going to fix you. He is going to solve every situation you have. But it's going to take some time. It's not going to just be overnight. But on that day when we came for deliverance, God planted a seed in our lives. And that seed is growing even today as you receive more word and as you hear the word of God coming into your life. In Philippians, the first chapter in the sixth verse, it says the following. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion into the day of Christ Jesus. Wow. Thank you, God, for delivering me. I couldn't even solve one problem. And she solved the whole entire Rubik's Cube in less than five minutes. Look what God can do. Because Leroy couldn't solve one color. But when you place it into the hands of somebody that knows what they're doing, little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. Amen? We're limited in what we can do, what we know. But God is unlimited unlimited. So God is trying to 
evolve us. And so he puts that seed inside of us and he's cultivating it. But the thing about a seed is this. How long does it take to plant a seed? Yeah, a minute. A minute a seed can be planted in just one minute. But how long does it take for that seed to go from being a seed to being a, a full-on a bush or a flower? Wow, we got a horticulturist in here. Brother Eddie's like six to eight weeks, depends on the time of season and the particular location and how much water and how much sun and how much exposure. What type of flower it is? Is it a bush? Is it a plant? Is it... My like, good Lord, I wasn't meaning that deep, Mr. Green Thumb. I'm not aware of what green plants look like. All of them are brown in my house. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. I just wanted to get her reaction. Although we were in a season where we had a lot of dead plants. But thank God we're past that season. But the point is that it only takes a moment to plant a seed. It only takes a brief moment to plant that seed. But within that seed is everything that is necessary to bloom and blossom into a full-on beautiful tree or a bush or a flower. Everything that is necessary is in that seed. So your deliverance on that day was planted in your lives in the form of that seed. But the other thing that I find very, very interesting about planting a seed, in each one of our lives, we tend to look at our lives and we reflect back on who we were. And many of us know that we were a mess before God got a hold of us. And if we're all honest, we know that we were just filthy and dirty until God covered us in his blood. But don't you know something that's interesting about seeds? You don't put a seed into a clean environment. A seed is planted underneath the dirt and the soil. All the things that we look at, and when, when, when you, sick, you see this ground and you look at that dirt, nobody looks at the dirt and says, oh, I want to rub that all over me. You look at dirt and you say, ew, that's disgusting, that's gross, that's impure, that's imperfection. And God is saying, that's what our life looked like before he got a hold of us. We were a mess. We were disgusting, we were disgraceful, but he planted a seed inside of us. Deep inside of that dirty, filthy person, God planted a seed. But don't you know that all those things that we once looked at, at, that they were disgusting and gross in the form of that dirt, is now no longer called dirt, but now we just call it soil. And from that same exact dirt that once people looked at, at you and said, oh, that person's not going to be any good. No, look at him. Look at how, look how he looks. Look at what he's into. Look what he was involved in. All those things that people used to hold you accountable to, God is saying that all those things are the same thing I'm going to use to flourish that seed that I put inside of you. Not only do I, is it there, but I need that dirt in order for that seed to be successful. That dirt is going to be nourishment to that seed. So God is calling us to recognize that, yes, we once were a mess. Yeah, we did need deliverance. But God said, don't get deceived by that, what you were. I am going to use that to my glory, and it is going to cause you to be an agent of change. God said, you're not where you are by accident, and you're not who you are by accident. I have created you like that. And that same thing that you once were known for being a, a drunk or being a womanizer or being this or that, God's going to use them to turn that around to his glory. I know I talk to Deacon Jenkins all the time, and he's in the men's group, 
And he talks all, all the time about when he was younger, he was all over the place and he used to drink and do all these things. And then God came into his life and changed him. And then all of a sudden, he was an upstanding, law-abiding citizen and a man of God. And soon he became a deacon in the church. Amen. And when he tells the story, he talks about how no good he was and how he used to lose his monies in the bars and in the gambling rooms. And then he said one day he changed, he got into a situation that he couldn't solve on his own. And he said to God, God, if you get me out of this situation one more time, I promise you I won't go back. And what did God do? God got him out of that situation. And what did he do? He never went back. (laughs) Amen, amen. And now he tells that story to all the young men that are coming up now. And now he uses that testimony to let us young men to know that no matter what you're into, God can and he will deliver you. So a message that once upon a time could have brought disgrace on him and made him look poorly now is used as a testimony to talk about the goodness of God. And what God was showing me and and, and, and imparting into my spirit is to show me that too many times we look at our lives and we look what we're going through and it's just so focused on the past things that we did that we can't see all the progress that we have made and who we have come in Christ. And also what God is showing me is so many times when we get these bondages and, and we get into these situations We don't realize God is moving and we keep praying, God, deliver me from this situation. God, I need you to take me out of this. God, please take me out of this prison that I am in. And God is saying to you, why are you praying to let you out of that situation when I'm the one who put you into that situation? He said, I'm the one that put you in that situation. And you know why? He said, because you're my secret agent. I put you in there for a purpose. I put you in there for a purpose. Turn with me to, I didn't put it on the projector, but turn with me to Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts, the 16th chapter. Minister Laurie, do you have it? Do you think you could read that for me today? Can you get her a, a, a microphone? Can you get, pass her one of the microphones? I need her to put on her professional voice. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as he went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in the numbers daily. And when they had gone throughout Phrygia and region of Is that is that Acts the sixteenth chapter? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's in the King James Version. Okay, okay. Keep going. (laughs) I may be pronouncing words wrong, but I think I'm in the right chapter. in the region of Galatea, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach in the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit permitted them not, and they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. 
And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, losing from Traos, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia in a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And okay. on the Can you now go down to 16? You want me to use your Bible or just read it from there? Um, on the Sabbath, um, if you could do it on the projector, I can read the right version. Okay, go to the 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Can you pause right there? I just want to point one thing out here as well. Many of us see people, these people that are telling fortunes and that are, are, are telling people all this stuff online, and we don't realize that that stuff is real. That stuff is real. People have spirits in them that allow them to see into the future. So don't be deceived and think that the devil can't tell you the future. That is possible because there are certain people that have spirits and demonic forces at play that can look into your life and tell you things that are come. We'll come back to that. Well, let me just get through this next part. Go ahead. Verse 17, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Amen, amen. Keep going. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us, Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Okay, pause right there. So we see in the story that Paul and Silas were going out to do God's will. They were going out to minister God's will, and they ran into a woman that was possessed by demon spirits and was able to tell the future. But the thing that was interesting about the spirit, that even though it was a spirit of the enemy, all it could say about them was that this, these are men of God. They, the, even the spirits had to proclaim that they were men of God and that they were called and anointed. That just goes to show us that the enemy can't speak against you when you're a man of God, woman of God. When they come against a true man or woman of God, even the dem demons have to tremble and bow down at his name. And so what happens is this. This woman was gaining people money because she was reading their futures. But what happened was they got so tired of her that they cast that demon out of that woman on the spot. And though it was a good thing, it had some repercussion. Sometimes we think that we're doing the will of God, and we are, but sometimes there are side effects. And it's not always good. Because when you come against the devil and you start to disrupt his kingdom, he gets angry with us. And therefore, he starts to plot and plan against our lives. 
And the next thing, just like Paul and Silas, you see yourself being brought in the midst of the people and all of a sudden everybody turns against you. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've seen some people have everybody turn against them. All those people that even sometimes were talking all positive about you, the next minute they can start talking negatively about you just as easily. And so Paul and Silas see themselves getting bought in front of all the people and they start to severely flog them and start to, to strip them down and to beat them with rods. Now, we get all upset and in arms when somebody says a negative word about you. And then we get all sad and we want to leave the church. Can you imagine if we stripped you down naked and started beating you with rods and throwing rocks? Now I would excuse you for leaving the church if that happened. I'll be right behind you. But we see what they had to go through in order to do what God has told them to do. And so their name was tarnished. Everything that they held dear was put into, called into jeopardy. And so they got thrown into jail. And they were told to, the guard that was, put them in jail was told to watch over them carefully. Okay, pick up at verse 24. Verse 24, Acts 16, 24. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their seat in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Okay, hold on a second here. So I got to ask you a question. If you had been lied upon, stripped down naked, beat in the middle of the court, in the middle of downtown, and then thrown into the innermost parts of jail, would your first reaction be to stop praying and singing songs of Zion? I don't hear a whole lot of people saying, yeah, sign me up for that. But all of a sudden, these men of God showed who they really are. And they began to pray and they began to sing and rejoice in the Lord. And not only that, but they did it at midnight. In the midnight, in the late night hours, they were on their knees praying and singing unto God, even in the midst of what is probably their worst circumstances. I tell you that when we understand that when we find ourselves in the deep trouble and despair, what we need to do is just drop down on our knees and begin to pray and call on the name of God, even in the late night hours when nobody else is around to see it, hear it, we got to believe and trust in God. We got to put our faith in God. Danny, can you get on that organ, please? Brother Tyler, can you get on that drum? And what it says is that late in the midnight hour, late in the midnight hour, when nothing else was going right, they had to drop on their knees and begin to pray unto God. And in the midnight hour, as they began to pray and as they began to sing, all those people that were around them began to listen to them and hear them pray and praise God. And then let's continue to read on. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that foundations of the prison were shaken at once. Hold on a second. Brother Danny, can you, get, can you just hold on one of, them, one of them low notes? Give me some volume. Give me some volume. Give me some volume. Suddenly. And that, Brother Tyler, can you give me them toms all the way over the right there? All the way down, all the way down. Louder, louder, louder. There we go. And now, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison was shaken. And once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. 
suddenly, 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 every chain, every door, everything that was holding them captive was shaken and broken. Suddenly, in the midnight hour, after they had prayed and sang and gave glory to God, every chain was broken. I said, suddenly in the midnight yeah, hour, yeah, yeah, when they yeah. began to pray, every chain was broken. And the doors that had held them captive were open wide. Yeah. Now, I got to let you know that you may see that that situation that you're in is unable to be freed. But God is saying that I have placed you there for a reason. And you may not be able to see what that, mo that reason is right now. It may not be clear and obvious just yet, but wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord and then he will reveal to you why you are where you are. And so in this moment, when the doors are beginning to open, that, that, that jailer that had placed them there, the same jailer that shackled their, their hands together. The same jailer that slammed the door and locked it behind them. He began to get worried. He began to wonder, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? Why? Because he knew that they were gone. He knew that he had failed at his mission. And the next thing you know is he was getting ready to kill himself. But just as he began to kill himself... You know what they said? They said, wait, don't do it. Wait, don't do it. Because we have not left yet. Go ahead and continue to read. Verse 28. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what, what, what must I do to be saved? They replied... Hold on a second. Do you hear what just happened? Paul and Silas had the opportunity to escape their situation. But God was not done with their assignment yet. What I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, is that God has placed you there for a reason. Look to your neighbor on your left... And look to your neighbor back on your right and say, I'm here on assignment. <laughs> say, I'm a secret agent. <laughs> See, God has you there for a reason. He has placed you there for an assignment and for a purpose. And it's not for you. It's because God needs you to minister to somebody else. God could have delivered them at any time along the way, but he had a person that needed to know about the goodness of the Lord. And he couldn't just hear the words, he had to experience the will of God. He had to experience the miracle of God. He had to experience the grace of God. He had to experience the power of God. See, sometimes it's not enough just to hear the words. You have to experience the magnitude of his glory and his grace. And so from this experience, this man knew that their God was real. And so he began to come to them and he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? But that wasn't yet enough. It wasn't just enough that he got saved. Can you read on next? What did it say after that? Verse 31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And so not only was the man saved, but his entire household was saved. How were they saved? Because these two men that were sitting in a jail cell were so in love with God that they said, I will not allow my situations to dictate how I will respond to my God. 
If I'm on a mountaintop, I'm going to praise my God. If I'm in my valley low, I'm going to praise the Lord. If I look like a preacher, I'm going to praise my God. If I look like a prisoner, I'm going to praise my God. If I have a thousand dollars, I'm going to praise my God. My God. If I have just one dollar, I'm going to praise my God. If I am educated, I will praise my God. And if I am uneducated, I'm going to praise my God. No matter what, I am going to praise my God. And so because they didn't allow this situation to dictate their response, this man was saved. And not only was the man saved, but his entire family was saved because they were obedient to the word of God. Continue on because, wait, there's more. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God and he and his whole household. Hold on right there. I just want to point out that when God begins to do a work, even those people that were your worst critics and your biggest enemies, God will turn them around. And before you know it, those that were your jailers will be those that are bringing you and cleaning you up and giving you food and putting money in your pockets. God will turn them around and put them in your favor. God will do it. Continue on. Because wait, there's still more. Verse 35, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. Pause right there. So after all that stuff that they had did, all of a sudden they decide that, you know what? You can go. You're free. You're free to go. Go ahead and be on your merry way. But you know, sometimes God doesn't want us to go quietly. Sometimes God doesn't want us to take the high road. Sometimes God wants us to make a little noise and let people know what we're talking about. See, we may be humble sometimes, but other times he needs us to make a, 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 a roaring noise and let everybody know that the God we serve is the only one true God. Sometimes it's time for us to not speak with a still quiet voice, but to open up our mouth and confess to everybody around that the God we serve is all powerful. And so God told, didn't let them just go on their merry way. He said, hold on a second. Can you move forward? But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Say no. No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> Hold on a second. Wait a second here. Now you know Paul was feeling himself. Paul all of a sudden got on a whole nother level. He was like, no, wait a second. You're not going to humiliate me in front of all the entire public and then expect me to just sleep on out of here in the middle of night like nothing ever happened. He said, no, no, no. If you're going to make these accusations in front of public, then I need you to let me out of here in front of the public. I'm not letting you off easy like that. And I need you to say the same thing to the enemy. Enemy, you came at me with everything that you had. You came into my house. You started shaking things up. You tried to humiliate me. You tried to slander my name in public. And then you think it's okay 
No, I don't think so, enemy. Now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. And I'm gonna let everybody know that you are a liar. I'm gonna let everybody know that my God is victorious. I'm gonna let everybody know that you thought you were more powerful than my God and you failed. No, I'm not going quietly. So Paul said, you who put me in this situation need to come out and escort me out of that situation. And you know what? Keep going, there's more. So Paul demanded a parade. <laughs> the officer rep reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with their brothers and sisters and, and encouraged them. Then they left. Now, now, can you see what just happened? God turned that situation that seemed that it was so bleak and so d dark all the way around until the point where the officials had to publicly come down and humiliate themselves in front of the man and men of God and escort them out. And he showed and he made them do this in front of everybody. And the thing that was interesting is that when the magistrates figured out who Paul and Silas were, they changed their tune. And what I'm here to tell us, each of us here today, is when the enemy recognizes who he's dealing with, he's going to change his tune. When he realizes that he tried to push around the wrong person, he's going to change his tune. God has begun something inside of you in that seed. And that seed is working its way out. And it's working its way through all the dirt that was in our life. And it's working its way through all that soil. And you might not be able to see it, but it's happening underneath the surface. But one day, one day soon, it's going to break through the dirt that is called the soil of your life. And all of a sudden, that beautiful flower is going to begin to bloom. And everybody is going to look at you and they're going to say, how beautiful is that person? How beautiful do you look? How magnificent you are. And they are going to see you for the new creature that you are in Christ. And you know what's kind of interesting? When you go and you look at a garden and you see all of those beautiful flowers there, Ask me, let me ask you this. Have you ever looked at a garden and said, wow, look at all that soil there. Look at all that dirt there. All of a sudden, all that dirt gets covered by all the beauty that is the flower. And nobody can see all that stuff that once was there anymore. And God is saying that the same thing is going to happen in your life. All that dirt and disgusting stuff that once defined who you were, people are not going to see that any longer. All they're going to see is the beauty that God has created in you. But it takes one day at a time. One day at a time. As you work your way through your situation, God is saying, take it one day at a time. And soon you will be everything that I promised you you would be. He's not going to fail you. He has too much riding on you. He's invested too much in you. So he, what they say about the, big, about the businesses but once upon a time, 
is too big to fail. Too big to fail. He invested too much into you now. If you fail now, that looks bad on him. And he's not going to let that happen. So understand, people of God, that God is preparing the way for you. He is preparing the way for you and, and setting you up for success in ways that you didn't even expect to happen. There are ways you know were possible, but he is doing it for you. The last verse is in Philippians, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. And in Philippians, the fourth chapter, in the sixth verse, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your, uh, present your request to God. As you came that day, you presented your, your situations to God. You requested God to deliver you. And God heard your prayers. And he is delivering you. But it is a process. You're going to have some good days. You're going to have some bad days. You're going to have some days when you feel like you have messed up so bad that you've lost all the progress that you made. But God wants to remind you that he hasn't given up on you. He has not forgotten you. And he believes just as much in you today as he did on the day that he delivered you. But you have to trust and believe that you were and that you are delivered. And take it one day at a time.